Uh, we are ready to start this uh, round rounds today. Uh, and uh, and since we are with this uh, dinner that we have here prepared in the first slide, um, uh oh, <laughs> now we have a problem. <laughs> this bottle is in the sala. Um, well, you can, everybody can see that this is, uh, today the topic is uh, microbiology uh, and, and Dr. Alan Janker is going to give us uh, Campylobacter in the turkey. This is awful. <laughs> uh, but this also reminds me to, I want to mention this at the end, that, that uh, this coming uh, uh, Wednesday, we're not going to have a ground round. We are going to be celebrating with all this uh, dinner. Uh, but, um, but today we are going to uh, go to another topic of uh, microbiology. And Alan, please uh, go ahead with your Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I, um, I, I, I kind of chose this because, you know, a few years ago, there was a rather unfortunate incident at a, at a family Thanksgiving dinner that I went to. So uh, today we're going to talk about all the, some of the things that could go wrong at Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about gastroenteritis here. So let's start with the patient here. Here's, here's a patient we'll just uh, throw together, a 37-year-old. Shows up the Monday after Thanksgiving, uh, 36 hours of profuse diarrhea, 10 to 12 times a day. He's got a fever. He's got abdominal cramping. He's not feeling good at all. And then I'm going to throw in some stuff. And, I, you know, when I did this case study originally, I basically made up a whole bunch of stuff just to throw people off the trail, you know. So I had a foot wound 10 months ago that he took some antibiotics for. He's a farmer, he's got all these animals, well water, homegrown vegetables, all of these things that can kind of make you think, you know, of, of one bug or another. Uh, the burger that was red in the middle, but that was two weeks ago, maybe that's too long ago. Uh, and the fact that he went bowling two days ago means absolutely nothing, you know, but with case studies, you know, it's, it's fun to throw in some red herrings every now and then. So let's think about a, a presentation like this, gastroenteritis, first of all, diarrhea, abdominal cramping, there's a whole slew of things. And, you know, this, to be honest with you, I am no expert when it comes to all these various things here. So this is just what I got from Google about things that can give you diarrhea uh, or gastroenteritis um, that are non-infectious. But this is infectious diseases. We're going to talk about infectious gastroenteritis so uh, basically, we'll look at bacterial, viral versus parasitic. And I'm going to come at this from a microbiology standpoint, which basically just to kind of show you what we do and what we can do in the lab to kind of help out with this diagnosis. First of all, let's look at the stats. Now, this table um, comes from CDC. It's on their website right now. You can go take a look at it. Um, I think it's pretty old data. They don't actually tell you uh, what it's, uh, you know, what year they put this together, but it's based on population statistics from 2006. So I think this is probably about 15 years old here, but it's still the one that they have on their website. And first of all, also let me, this is foodborne infection in this table. This is not necessarily gastroenteritis. So I'm going to be talking about gastroenteritis, real intestinal symptoms. Uh, but this applies to anything that is foodborne. Uh, so you'll see that there's some bugs on here like toxoplasma, like hepatitis that we don't think of as being a gastrointestinal infection or a gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, brucella, we had a case of brucella just uh, a few months ago that actually presented as epididymitis. So not GI at all, but it was foodborne. Uh, but still, if we kind of look at this and say most cases of foodborne infections are going to lead to gastroenteritis, then you can look at this and say the bugs that lead by a long shot, shot are the viruses up here. A lot more cases of viral gastroenteritis than there are parasitic gastroenteritis or bacterial gastroenteritis. Um, the viruses lead. In fact, norovirus, if you add up all the numbers, there's a lot more norovirus than there is everybody else put together. Uh, so uh, norovirus is going to be the number one case. So we could look at our patient and say, just completely without looking at his presentation, he comes in with gastroenteritis. Uh, the, the chances are that that's going to be 
viral. So you're his doc. What are you going to do with him? Uh, he comes into your office. Well, one thing that you can do is just send him home, not do anything. And for the most part, that's often not a bad choice to do because the huge majority of diarrheal illnesses are self-limited. They're going to go away in a couple of days and the person's going to be fine. Um, in fact, if you look back at that table, I'm going to go back here. If you go look back at this, one thing to point out is we don't actually diagnose near this number. I mean, 5%, just saying uh, somewhere around a very low percentage of these actually get diagnosed. And, and the reason is people tend not to go to their doctor with diarrhea unless it's really bad. Um, and a lot of times when they do, the, the choice is just go home, sit it out, it'll go away. Stay hydrated. You can take some Pepto, it's, it's going to, to pass eventually. I, I put the asterisks, asterisks here next to Imodium because if, if it's an infectious cause, you really don't want to use Imodium or other anti-motility agents like that. They're not recommended. So in our patient, our patient's got a fever, uh, suggested that this is going to be an infectious cause, perhaps, of gastroenteritis. You should not give him Imodium. Uh, but you could send him home and say, just kind of wait it out. Uh, but on the other hand, these this is kind of an amalgamation here of, of guidance from the American College of Gastroenterology and the American Infectious Diseases Association on what to do when patients present with gastroenteritis. And they recommend that you do some sort of diagnostic evaluation uh, if the patient has any of these uh, situations right here. Um, so for example, if they work in certain professions where it's possible that they can spread it to, to other people, uh, if there's a known outbreak going on. But in our case, we know that our patient has at least three of these signs. So the guidelines would be, yes, you should take a look at this. You should try to figure out what is causing this. Um, plus, from a public health perspective, uh, if we never look for these causative agents, then we're never going to know what's out there. You know, how are you going to say, oh, don't worry about it, it's just norovirus, unless we actually look for the norovirus. So uh, we want to know as much as possible about what is causing these, these outbreaks so that we can pursue them uh, if statistics show that this looks like it could be an outbreak. And I'll talk a little bit more later about the uh, public health significance of sending your isolates to the state lab and having them uh, do some epidemiological typing with those. Here's a first hint that you can kind of take uh, from whether a diagnostic evaluation will be of much help. Uh, is it a, an inflammatory diarrhea or is it a non-inflammatory? Uh, so this is just kind of, these non-inflammatory ones are basically going to be watery diarrheas that are uh, watery diarrheas. There's not any inflammation going on. Since there's not really any inflammation, you're not going to have fecal leukocytes. Or these days, you know, basically what you should be doing would be a lactoferrin or calprotectin test instead of fecal leukocytes. Those are going to be negative. Uh, and these are the bugs that are probably going to be causing that. Whereas an inflammatory diarrhea is where the organism is going to be more invasive. And because it's, it's disrupting that mucosal integrity, that's why it's getting into the tissues a little bit. That's going to cause a fever. So here, plain watery diarrhea over on the inflammatory side, you can have the fever, you can have the abdominal pain. Uh, and these are the bugs that are probably going to be causing that. You will probably have fecal leukocytes in the blood or lactoferrin in the blood. Now, the reason that's kind of helpful to know from a workup standpoint is if you look at these bugs, we're really not going to detect any of these bugs except maybe Vibrio cholera, which is very rare in the United States. We're really not going to detect those on a routine stool culture workup, whereas most of these, or at least some of these, we will. Um, so you can use that kind of dichotomy there to say in these situations, a stool culture is probably not going to be very helpful. Whereas over here, it might lead to something uh, significant. So I'm a microbiology person. Let's talk about stool cultures because stool is different from everything else. Uh, there's, there's some special aspects about stool. Uh, and that most importantly is that 
stool has a massive amount of normal flora. I mean, there's hardly any situation, any place ever in the entire world that has a higher burden of bacterial growth uh, than poop. Uh, some people have said that one third of the dry weight of poop is bacterial weight. So it's a massive, massive amount of, of normal flora. Um, so a wound, a sputum is going to have a lot of normal flu, flora too. Uh, a wound is not going to have much. It'll have a little bit. And I've making up these percentages. I, I want to, I, I have not measured this. I just want to kind of point out that uh, there's a big difference between these specimens. Uh, if, a, if a physician does a good job of collecting uh, a wound culture, they do a good job of sampling the site of the infection, then there's not going to be much normal flora in there. 95, almost all the bug that's in the specimen is going to be the one causing the infection. It's harder in a sputum because the sputum is going to come up through the throat. It's going to pick up normal flora on the way. But still, if you've done a good job collecting that sputum and the patient really and truly does have bacterial pneumonia, then about half the, the, the bacteria that are in the specimen are going to be the pathogen. And then there'll be some that'll be normal flora, normal upper, upper respiratory flora that will come along. The problem with stool is even if you have, for example, a raging salmonella infection, that pathogenic organism is still going to be vastly outnumbered by other bugs that are there. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a very small portion of the total bacterial load. So you can't just streak it out, look at everything that grows, and try to decide if there's anything important here. You'd be, you'd be working up, you'd be identifying dozens of bacteria before you could get down to find the one that you're looking for. So what we have to do in a stool specimen is specifically say, these are the bugs that we are looking for. And then we're going to use techniques that will pull those bugs out uh, and, and kind of ignore all the rest of that normal flora. So every stool that we culture should be cultured specifically looking for at least these four organisms, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella, and E. coli 0157. And further tested for Shigatoxin 1 and 2 so that we can detect the, the E. coli's other than 0157 that produce Shigatoxin. Now, the methods that we use, you might also be able to pick up these guys, Yersinia entrocletica, Vibrio, Aeromonas, and Plesiomonas. You should be able to pick those up. Uh, just they'll come along with the, with the ride. Uh, there are special media that we can use for those that we really don't keep around, but we really would prefer it. It would be really nice if a physician said, you know what, this patient just came back from um, the, the Caribbean someplace. Um, they've been eating raw oysters or something. I think a Vibrio might be the cause here. In that case, we could either use special media if it's available, or at least we can go and kind of more, put more effort into it and to really say, let's dig down deep into this stool specimen here and see if we can find Vibrio from it. There are some special techniques that we can use. Uh, you may get those from a regular stool culture. All the rest of it, any normal floor E. coli, any other E. coli that are not a 157, any enterobatric clebsial, all of these other gram-negative rods, all the anaerobes are going to be ignored. We just pretend we didn't see them. There's, there's no interest in those at all. And we don't culture for anaerobes. So if you're looking for C. difficile, if you're looking for clostridium perfringens, uh, no, we're not going to culture for anaerobes. We're not going to find those. There is a rule for stool cultures. Hopefully everybody's following this rule. Uh, if a patient's been in the hospital for more than three days, we don't do a stool culture on them. Um, I have looked at our data because sometimes some slip through. Um, and I have, you can look at data from hospitals all over the country to show once you've gone beyond three days, you're really not going to find Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, or E. coli 157. Those are community acquired infections, and the symptoms are going to come on uh, fairly quickly. So um, that is a standard rule now, and all hospitals really should be following that. So let me show you some of the plates here. This is what we actually going to look for. This is a campy plate. This is a plate that is specifically to look for Campylobacter jejuni or Campylobacter coli. We see enough of that as well. 
Um, it's basically blood auger with five different antibiotics in it. Uh, you're going to look for isolated colonies out here, these kind of moist grayish colonies. I don't pay much attention to all of this here in the primary quadrant because you're, you're putting a whole bunch of poop on there uh, and it can overwhelm the antibiotics. But if you've got isolated colonies out here, we'll take those, we'll do a gram stain, you get these nice little curvy corkscrewish looking uh, gram negative rods and that's Campylobacter. You really don't need to do anything else. Uh, uh, these days, for those of us who have Maldi, you can put it on Maldi and, and figure out whether it's Juni or Coli pretty easily. Um, now, like I said, we're going to streak all our stool specimens out onto McConkie auger and to, we use Hectoin auger. There are a few other media that you could use in, instead of that. Um, if you look at this McConkie auger plate, there are at least three different bugs growing here. You can see this guy out here. Hopefully you can see my arrow. This guy out here, that one right there is different. This guy looks different. And he's there's a few of them that pop up in here as well. So there's at least three different gram-negative rods growing there. But notice that they are all pink. That means they're all fermenting lactose. I don't care. We are going to completely ignore any of that. Not interested in it. This is the same specimen on a hectoine auger plate. This orangey color. Um, is a normal flora bug, not interested in it. Um, so again, here, there's one, two, three, at least three different organisms. Um, this one we would look at and we would very quickly say, this is no growth salmonella, shigella, campylobacter, or E. coli 157. And we're done with this one. Um, that's just all normal flora. Now, yes, I said E. coli. Um, this could be, a 157, but I won't be able to tell from this plate. Uh, this is what we're looking for. So here's your normal flora. These pink guys are your normal flora bugs. But look at these guys here that you can call whatever color you want. Sometimes we call them buff colored. Sometimes we call them just translucent, uh, but they're not pink. That's what I'm looking for. That is what a Salmonella or Shigella would look like. So I'm going to take these colonies right here, and I'm going to work them up further to see whether that's Salmonella or Shigella. You can look at the uh, uh, hectoin plates. Again, this orangey, it's technically cantaloupe, if you're wondering. That's a cantaloupe color. I'm ignoring that. This guy here, who's yellowish with the black center, I'm ignoring that. But these colonies right here, these kind of darker greenish, bluish colonies, that one over there, uh, that is a uh, suggestive of Shigella. And we would work that up to see whether that's Shigella or not. This guy here looks like he is loaded with Salmonella. These kind of what we call blue-green colonies with black, uh, that's sug suggestive of Salmonella. So that's how we would go in and specifically look for certain organisms to pull them out which is why we know we don't put a report in saying we got heavy growth of E. coli and, and you know, light growth of normal flora. We don't do that kind of thing with stool specimens and why we list the bugs that we're specifically looking for. This is another specimen that we had uh, in July. Uh, this is a McConkie auger plate and you can see it's all pink. You look at that and say, I don't care. That's all normal flora bugs. I'm gonna throw it away. But this is a sorbitol McConkie. Here we're looking for sorbitol formation, fermentation instead of lactose fermentation. And you see, you got the pink colonies, but you got these guys in here, all these little buff colored colonies. That is, I'm going to pick those and test them to see whether that's E. coli 0157 or not. And sure enough, if it's 0157, um, then we're going to consider that uh, a pathogen. That bug is also over here. This is the same specimen. So he's over here as well. I just can't separate him from normal flora. He looks just like all the other normal flora E. coli. So I have to use this plate here to try to find him. Another thing that we'll do is shiga toxin testing. We use GN broth. Usually a lab will use some form of a broth to culture. Uh, and then the next day, uh, we'll do one of these uh, little easy Immunographic, immunochromatographic assays to look for shigatoxin one, shigatoxin two. This meridian one here is the one that we use right here. It's very simple, very easy to do. If I get a positive here and did not get 0157 on the plates, 
then I'm going to take that broth and I'm going to send it to Frankfurt. I'm going to send it to the state laboratory. And what they will do is they will attempt to isolate and serotype what they call the big six serotypes, 0157, but then of, uh, some other serotypes that are common among shiga toxin producing E. coli. If they can't find which serotype it is, then they'll send it onto the CDC and CDC will eventually do something with it. So at this point, from a diagnostic standpoint, we're pretty much done. We've demonstrated that this patient's got shiga toxin two, for example, in their stool specimen. Uh, this part here, figuring out the actual serotype is more of an epidemiological concern, not a patient care concern, which is why that's handled by Frankfurt and the CDC and not by um, uh, clinical labs usually. The other thing that's really important to point out on a stool culture is whenever we isolate any of these things, should be sent to Frankfurt, should be sent to the state laboratory. Every hospital laboratory should be doing this. Uh, what they are going to do is they're going to genotype the organism. Uh, they've been using pulse field gel electrophoresis. They're in the process of switching to whole genome sequencing, believe it or not, you know, just sequence the whole genome and take a look at it. And all of that feeds into the PulseNet database that the CDC has. This is one of the best ideas that the CDC ever had. So if I have a salmonella here, we had a salmonella we isolated yesterday. Okay, that's going to the state lab today. They're going to do this whole genome sequencing on it. It's going to feed into the CDC's database. And the CDC is going to compare it to salmonella isolates from all over the country to see if it's a match. So for example, let's take all these little green stars. Okay, every one of those green stars is an isolate of salmonella that showed up today, okay? Uh, all of that gets sequenced. It gets fed into the CDC's computer and the CDC recognizes that these ones right here are all the same strain. Um, then they can look at what are the epidemiological connections between those patients? Did they all get lettuce from the same grocery store, the same grocery store chain, or from the same farm in California, or something like that, what, whatever else they have in common with each other. So these ones are all the same. And they may look at these guys and say, these ones here are all the same. It's different, but they're all the same one. And then they'll be able to uh, kind of start this investigation. And eventually at some point, hopefully, they may be able to work this back to say, well, we've um, we've kind of said that this particular farm or this particular grocery store, or this particular distribution center seems to be one thing that they all have in common. Uh, then we can try to isolate the bug from that source and do sequencing on that and see if it matches the patient isolates. So that's how you can track all around the country. You know, if you had this one person who showed up here in Kentucky with this, we really would have nothing to work with to figure out where did this person get this infection and is that source still infecting other people? But by feeding it all, we get all this national data. In fact, PulseNet is now international. So even if a patient had the same strain in South Africa or New Zealand or Japan, uh, they would be able to tie it back. Uh, so it's a great, uh, great use of fancy molecular genetics to really um, start and to go through epidemiological investigations. But it depends upon labs sending those isolates to the state lab. Uh, you have to do that. Uh, getting back here uh, to the hospital side of things, uh, a lot of these bugs don't really need treatment. Shigella should be treated. Uh, it is recommended. It will shorten the course of the disease and shorten shedding of the organism. Uh, we will do susceptibility. There's only a very few drugs that we actually can report on that. One of the common drugs that's used to treat it with now is azithromycin. It's really hard for hospital laboratories to do azithromycin on gram-negative organisms. It's not on any of those panels because it's typically not a gram-negative drug, uh, but can be used. Salmonella, 
the recommendation for most patients is do not treat salmonella. It does not shorten the course of the disease, and it makes it more likely that you'll continue to shed for long periods of time. So we do not do susceptibility testing on salmonella uh, or report it, except if the patient is less than six weeks of age, then it's more likely to become septicemic. So we'll go ahead and do susceptibility testing on those patients. Or if it's not in a stool, we pretty commonly get salmonella from urine cultures and from blood cultures. Uh, and of course, those are going to be uh, get susceptibility done. But again, there's a limited number. You can add ceftriaxone to this if it's extraintestinal. Campylobacter, there's usually no need for tr antibiotic treatment. Uh, if, if treatment is necessary, you can use a macrolide or a fluoroquinolone, but uh, most of the time you do not need to be treated. Most labs do not do the susceptibility testing in-house. It requires special media. It requires special incubation conditions, uh, and most labs will not do it. E. coli 157 and other shigatoxin produced E. coli, no. Uh, don't do susceptibility. Don't report drugs. Uh, it's still standard that you not um, treat those. And let's go over a few things here. That was the whole stool culture thing, which is what I really do most of. Uh, if it's viral, is it worth going through and trying to figure out what virus is causing it? Uh, none of the viruses can will be treated specifically. Viral GI is almost always going to be uh, self-limited. It's going to go away uh, within a day or two. Uh, so most of the time, we just say it's not really worth going through and figuring out what virus it is. Viral culture is not helpful. None of the bugs that cause uh, gastroenteritis uh, are easily cultured. There is antigen testing available for rotavirus, and then there is a PCR available for norovirus uh, that can be done. What about parasites? Uh, we don't get parasites very often. Uh, these are all things that suggest that you might want to look for parasites. Usually it's going to be, we've looked for everything else and I haven't found it. And so uh, let's keep looking for parasites. The patient still has symptoms. It's been two weeks. Uh, unexplained eosinophilia. Uh, we, we know there's an outbreak going on out there. It might be parasites. The recommended first step in the United States is to do a crypto antigen test like these. Uh, we use this one right here, the quick check. Uh, this is actually faster, much faster, much easier, and more sensitive than doing a full oven and parasites exam. So this is what should come first. Uh, if that's negative and the patient continues to have symptoms, then we can do a full uh, OMP. Now, let me tell you the alternative, because here we talked about stool culture, we talked about viral testing, we talked about parasitic testing. The alternative that's available out there uh, is a, a GI panel, PCR panel. This is the one that's on the BioFire instrument. We do not do this test here. Uh, we have decided not to do this test uh, at this point, but you can see all the different bugs, bacteria, parasites, and viruses that it detects. Uh, and you're probably thinking at the time that sounds expensive. Uh, yeah, it's an expensive test to do. So is it worth doing? Uh, here's some arguments in favor of it. You can, if you do this, you can say, I'm not going to do still cultures anymore. I'm not going to do crypto GRD antigen. I'm not going to do rotavirus antigen. I'm not going to do a norovirus PCR. So there's going to be tests that you can, your lab can quit doing if they're doing this panel. So you can look at it and say, yes, it's an expensive test. But when you add up the minor expenses of some of the other tests, you know, it might make it financially worthwhile to do. Some of these, this is the only way to detect these pathogens. I mean, if you look at this, come on, sapovirus, astrovirus, you know, who's ever looked for those? You know, we've never looked for those. So in uh, these guys right here, enteroagrative, enteropathogenic, enterotoxogenic E. coli, we don't look for those. We don't look for those. Uh, nobody, we never have. Uh, so it's the only way to detect some of these bugs. And it gives you great epidemiological information. I've played with this. If I had my way, I would take every poop I could find and put it on this machine uh, and look at it because it gives you such cool data. This is national data that you can get from BioFire's website where they show you the percentages here. And you can kind of see this brown line, coincidentally a brown line, uh, is E. coli and Shigella. This is all the different types of E. coli and Shigella mixed together. So you got to kind of wonder about it. Most of this is actually enteropathogenic E. coli. 
And you have to kind of wonder when you're getting 25% of them are positive. Over here, you're getting 22% positive. Uh, what does it really mean? And that's one of the big problems of this. What, is, what does this really mean? Here's C, difficile, which if you're like me, you're like, why is that on the panel in the first place? We don't want to be doing a C, diff, PCR on everybody who's, who's got a little bit of diarrhea. Uh, but great epidemiological data. Uh, wonderful to do. Here's reasons not to do it. It's very expensive. Uh, and it may not be re reimbursed uh, for outpatients, which most of these people will be outpatients. Um, they uh, they may be stuck with a really big bill. If you get a positive hit for Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, 0157, you should still do a culture uh, so that you can send that isolate to the state. Now, what the state tells me is that most of the time what people are doing is they're just sending the stool specimen to the state, let the state do the whole thing. Um, yeah, you can do that. But honestly, if you're going to be a good stewards of state resources, you should try to do the culture yourself and send that organism. Um, some of these are really tricky. Some of these have very low positive predictive values because the pretest probability was very low. Uh, the enteropathogenic E. coli there is a good example. We're finding seven and a half to 10% of patients who get this panel have enteropathogenic E. coli. What does that mean? Is that causing the symptoms or is that just a bystander? Well, apparently a lot of people are colonized with enteropathogenic E. coli. Then um, um, here's, a, here's a good story. I'm already at 12.30, but let me tell you this good story here. Uh, you know, the, the total... Vibrio cholera comes out to be like 0.4%. Uh, you know, if you look at just our laboratory itself, if if we if 0.4% of our stool cultures were put on this panel, if, sorry, if we put all our stool cultures on this panel instead of doing the stool culture, and 0.4% of them were positive for Vibrio cholera, you know, we would have had like eight or nine cases of cholera so far this year, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, we don't have that much cholera around the United States. But the transport medium, if you know the Cary Blair transport medium that we send stool specimens in, that contains a little bit of auger. Auger is an extract of seaweed. Seaweed comes from the ocean. Who lives in the ocean? Fibrios. So there now are documented cases of what's causing these positive PCRs. It's not that the bug is there, but that DNA from the ocean uh, is in there. It's crazy. Uh, so we don't know what to do with some of that information. And a lot of this, in fact, there's one study which showed only 2.9% of the time would it actually have changed patient management. So we're spending a lot of money for something where basically we're going to say, go home, drink Gatorade, uh, and wait by the john until you get better in a day or two. So that's what I got on, on acute gastroenteritis. Um, just thought it was appropriate and hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving and the couple of days after Thanksgiving as well. Any questions for me? This was uh, uh, excellent uh, overview. Thank you, uh, Alan, as, as always. Um, let me see in the in the chat if there's any <clears throat> any comments or <clears throat> or questions. <clears throat> Have um, you, you alluded that with the, the biofire uh, and this is uh, an issue that we have as we are developing more and more PCR detection of microorganisms. It's nice to see that in the biofire in this uh, annual report there was. Uh, Clostridium difficile was a standard uh, organism identified uh, regularly. Is this data from uh, ambulatory cases of diarrhea or, or hospitalized patients? Or, or because is, the, is diarrhea a community acquired or, or patients that were more than three days in the hospital that we consider the Denise is the hospital acquired gastroenteritis? Well, we don't know. Uh, because where that data comes from is, is BioFire, the company that makes these panels. Um, 
will can has a syndromic trends they call it where what they do is they hook your machine up to their server in the sky the cloud there and it uploads the information if you're a member of this group it uploads your information so what this is saying is that of all the thousands of panels that were done uh, this is how many were, were positive for c diff there's no patient information in it uh, so no one's looking up to see whether this is hospitalized patient outpatient any of that data so it's just 15% of the test. Yeah, and then the, the other question, you alluded to this because you, you mentioned, say, I don't know what to do with this data. Yeah. But, but then, but let me ask you, what will you do with a, with a positive PCR for, for CD? What, what is the, the, the clinical significance? Then you are in a, a yeah. seeing these patients, you decided to send a biofire or a, and then you have a positive PCR for CD. What, what is the next step? Or what, do we, what do we need to think? Well, you know, if, if we were doing it and, and we got that, then yeah, you'd have to say, let's look at that patient and say, is this important or not? Now, BioFire, this panel has been around for a long time. BioFire um, insisted that C. diff be on that panel. And they were told by a lot of people, including me, no, we don't want C. diff on the panel because, you know, especially look at it now, you know, somebody comes in and, and has salmonella you know, a lot of people have salmonella are colonized with C. diff at the same time. They're going to hit, have a hit for C. diff. And so you're getting all these cases of C. diff where that are not significant. You know, it's, it's just colonization. So, yeah, I, I had told them it shouldn't be on there. And finally, after probably six, seven years, what they have done is they've now changed the software so that a laboratory can elect to not have C. diff reported. So if we brought this panel in, then that's what I would do. I would say, we're going to pretend like C. diff is not on the panel. It, the machine's not going to tell me the C. diff result. If you think this patient may have C. diff, if you want to test for C. diff, then we have a process for looking at C. diff. Uh, but in general, community-acquired gastroenteritis, um, it, it's, going to, it's going to raise too many flags. It's going to be too difficult to, to really... Um, Decipher. You may say that the patient has a positive PCR for C. diff, then follow with toxin, follow. Well, yeah, that's a possibility. It is uh, We can say, you know, we're going to treat it just like our C. diff PCR, where what we'll do is, is we'll do the PCR and we'll automatically reflex to a C. diff toxin test so that we can report out, yes, your patient had C. diff, but the, uh, the toxin test was negative. So if the toxin test is negative, the assumption there is there's not enough toxin to really be causing symptomatic disease. So we can go that way. That, that's something, you know, if we ever decide to bring this in, something we'll have to think about. David, do we have any uh, questions from the members of the audience? I don't see anything in the chat. Um, then I can... Uh, I know that, that, that this is a microbiological talk, and we're not supposed to talk about uh, treatment, but still I want to ask you, <laughs> I want to ask you for the, for the controversial topic of, of probiotics uh, in this patient <laughs> uh, with uh, diarrhea, uh, because uh, again, we don't, uh, there's a lot of controversy, uh, but, but you know, some people say, oh, you give these bacteria, you modulate the immune system at the GI tract, or, or, or probably these patients, is something going on with these viruses? Is always you have something abnormal with your with your microbiome. Since you mentioned that 99% of what you get from the stool is all uh, normal flora, um, uh, and if someone were to to bring in the the question, uh, do what do, do you have any role for probiotics in in patients with with diarrhea, you already mentioned that we don't use antibiotics, uh, 99%, uh, some emodium or whatever, but, but um, since this is a common uh, question, and since these are more bacteria, that this is your area. <laughs> yeah. Any comments, Any comments on probiotics? Um, it's hard for me from the data that I get what I see, because when I see probiotics, it's when we're isolating them from an infection. 
so yeah, I've seen a lot of patients who've gotten infected with the bug that they were in, intentionally treating themselves with. You know, we've seen blood culture infections with lactobacillus salivarius and all kinds of things like that. So yeah, that happens. Uh, when it prevents infection, well, then I don't see it. So I, I'm very biased in how I look at that or, or what the data is available to me. But, you know, I would say, look, Taking, I, I don't see the point of, of taking pills uh, of, of bugs, you know, preps of bugs. Um, hey, if you like yogurt, have yogurt, you know, and it might be good for you. But, you know. But I think that you have a very important perspective because what you just mentioned is sometimes not well recognized that sometimes probiotics, if the person already have abnormal mucosa, the person is immunocompromised, the person that, that, that these are, you are injecting bacteria that may get into the systemic circulation and then you may get very sick with probiotics. It's important for people to see the, the good side, but also the bad side. Yeah, it, it, it does happen. I mean, uh, it doesn't happen particularly often. I mean, you still are loaded with a bunch of normal flora all over your body that could do the same thing. Um, so it, it's a it's not it's a it's a tough call. It's a tough call. I would I would say I have no problem with with uh, probiotics most of the time. Try it and see if it helps you any. But I don't have any data to suggest that uh, it's going to magically keep you from getting Campylobacter. And then you mentioned that that now that that acetromycin is sometimes recommended as one of the empiric therapies, the patient is sick. Uh, it's interesting, you mentioned that, that even though this is recommended as empiric therapy, we don't have the capability to do susceptibilities for acetromycin. It, it would be an add-on, a special thing, because the, the gram-negative panels, and, and the ones that we use in different manufacturers may be slightly different, they do not have azithromycin on there, because that's really a, a gram-positive drug or a drug for you know the atypical gram-negative rods that uh, that um, you don't do susceptibility tests on anyway. Uh, could we do it? Yeah, it would it would be a separate test. We would have to say, okay, now I know I've got a shigella. Um, I'm going to have to set up a second test to do it. Uh, it's only been recently, uh, in the past year or so, that there have been breakpoints for azithromycin for Shigella and Salmonella. Uh, up to this point, we've had what's called epidemiological cutoff values, uh, where you can just kind of guesstimate and say, well, okay, if, if this is what the MIC is, then it's it's probably good. Uh, but we have breakpoints now. That's only been the last year or two. Um, so can be done. We have not done it yet, uh, just because there's been other higher priority things um, on the on the on the docket. Yeah. yeah. Very good, uh, David. Do we have any other uh, comments or? I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay. Well, um, Alan, as always, we want to thank you very much. It was an, an excellent uh, presentation, even though um, you brought all these possibilities with <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner and all these microorganisms, uh, but. Um, as, as David mentioned, again, thank you very much. As David mentioned, this coming uh, Wednesday, we're going to have uh, Grand Rounds, and then uh, we're going to skip you to the uh, holidays. Uh, and we are going to um, continue on the terrace. And he also, David mentioned that, that we already have a day for our uh, vaccine um, course that is going to be an overview of all the uh, vaccines for adults. Um, that is going to be on, what is the day of the review course, David? Is, uh, the vaccine update is November 30th. So. November 30th. November yes, say it's a full day on, on uh, vaccines for adults. And with this, um, thank you very much for your uh, attendance. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to all the audience. And, we'll, uh, and as Alan mentioned, have a safe uh, Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. Bye.